indeed today to have Brother Richard Stevens III to be our speaker on this occasion. Richard is a graduate of the Brown Trail School of Preaching back in, when was it, about 1990 what? I think about 99 or 98, right in there. I remember when he was here as a student. And he has done such a wonderful job ever since leaving Brown Trail as the preacher for the Horn Freeway Church of Christ over in Dallas. And he is also a part-time instructor in the school today. And so uh, we appreciate him so very much. And he had a son that also came to the Brown Trail School, Desmond. Is he preaching now? Or? Yes, sir. Preaches at Red Oak, Texas. He's preaching at Red Oak, Texas. So a father and son combination, and we love them very much. Uh, Richard's wife is named Angela, and they have six children, and one of those, of course, is Desmond, as I've already mentioned. He's going to be bringing a lesson concerning the inward struggles that all of us face. And the Apostle Paul makes mention of those struggles in the seventh chapter of the book of Romans. And of course, our theme is gleanings from the book of Romans. So. We tried to search diligently uh, the book itself and come up with some themes that we felt would be of interest to everybody. So we're looking forward to Richard preaching on this subject. Richard, we're glad to have you. If you have your Bibles, will you turn with me to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. That's my assignment, Romans chapter 7. And verse 7 through chapter 8 and verse number 6. I want to thank Brother Maxey and the elders here at this fine congregation uh, for the invitation to be on this uh, very grand lectureship. I also want to thank all of you, many friends and family, brethren, of being together for you being here also, and for all of the speakers who have spoken thus far. In Romans chapter 7, I want you to see, and I, I guess let me reiterate my, my subject. My subject is our inward struggles, our inward struggles. You know, Paul is writing to Jewish and Gentile Christians about, at least in this section of scripture, about their inward struggles. And Paul knows what it's like to struggle with sin, because Paul, he knows what it's like to struggle with sin uh, under the Mosaic Covenant. He knew what it was like to struggle with sin before Christianity. He knows what it was like to struggle with sin in Christianity. So in chapter 7, Paul, he's writing uh, to those brethren to tell them about, about what it was like under the old law to struggle with sin. You know, uh, Paul, he is speaking from experience because Paul lived under the law and Paul was taught the law. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 5 that he was of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and a touch of the law, a Pharisee. Paul said in Acts chapter 22 and verse number 3 that he was taught the perfect manner of the law at the feet of Gamaliel. You remember in Acts chapter 5 and verse number 34 that Gamaliel was a doctor of the law and all the Jews held him in high regard. And not only that, Paul said in Acts 23 and verse number 1 that he had lived before God in all good conscience until his day. So in other words, Paul not only lived under the law, Paul was not only taught the law, but Paul tried to live as best he could according to the law. And so Paul is writing to these brethren, and he asked the question. He said, is the law sin? And then he said, God forbid. We would, say, we would say it this way, that we would say absolutely not high absurd. The law is not sin. Sin is transgression of God's law, 1 John 3 and verse number 4. But perhaps some thought so, because here the old law has been done away with, and here's a new law. 
I, someone just said that uh, a couple of weeks ago. I heard they, they said something was wrong with the old law. That's why God gave us the new law. You know, that's, that's strange. There's nothing wrong with the old law. It wasn't perverted in any way. You think about this, that God, who in 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 5, God who is light and in whom there is no darkness. God, Genesis 18 and verse number 25, who the judge of all the earth and he does right. God, Deuteronomy 32 and verse number 4, who is a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. God, who in Matthew 6 and verse number 9, Jesus said, hallowed be thy name. That's the God who gave the law. There's nothing wrong with the law. A just, right, and perfect God cannot give a law that's imperfect. You know, over in Psalm 19, you look at Psalm 19 in verse 7 through 9, my Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And when you go back over to Romans chapter 7, Paul concurs. Because Paul said in Romans 7 and verse number 12, Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, just, and good. Verse 14, the law is spiritual. There was nothing wrong with the law. See, the problem was transgression of the law. So the indictment is not against God. The indictment was against the people. That's why, because they transgressed it. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse number 7, it said that if the first covenant had been found faultless, then should no place be found for the second. But then the next verse says, for finding fault with them. Finding fault with them. Because the majority of the Jews didn't keep the law, even though some did. You know, in Luke chapter 1, you have Elizabeth and Zacharias, who were John the Baptist's parents. And in verse number 6, speaking about them, it says, they were both righteous before God walking in all the commandments and ordinance of the Lord, blameless. But you know, the problem with the old law was that it had to be kept perfectly. And no one did. That's why Paul said in Romans chapter 3 and verse number 23 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In Romans 3 verse 9, that Jew and Gentile were under sin. In Romans 3 verse 10, that none righteous, no, not one. They all transgressed. And if you transgressed at one time, then you were condemned. You remember James 2 and verse number 10? Whosoever offends at one point is guilty of it all. And so that led some, so some perhaps may have thought what people think today. I've heard somebody say this. They said, you know, no one can keep the old law. No one can keep it. And I wonder, well, then why did God give it? If nobody can keep the old law, why did God give it to people, his people? And then I asked him this question. I said, have you read about Jesus? <clears throat> Jesus Christ kept the old law as a human being. That's why in John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, it said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him, and without him, without anything made which was made. And in verse number 14, the Word became flesh. And dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. In Philippians chapter 2, in verse number 7, he took over him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, or born of a woman. Even in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, in all things he was made like unto his brethren. You know, my point is that he was a human being, and he lived under that old law, and he kept that old law perfectly. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, in verse number 15, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And he lived under the old law. And let me just say this, because you know the Bible says in 1 Peter 2, verse 21 and 22, 
that Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps, who did no sin. He was our example, but he lived under the law, old law, and he did no sin. Like Brother uh, Randall Morris said, we live under the law today. The law of Christ, 1 Corinthians 9, verse number 21. We live under that royal law, James 2, 8, that law of liberty, uh, uh, James 1, verse number 25. We are under the law, Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. My point is none of us should sin today either. <laughs> we shouldn't sin today. They shouldn't have sinned then. See, it's not our inability. We have the ability to do it, but it's our default. We don't. What Paul's going to go through is because of the lust of our flesh. It's not because we can't keep God's law. God would never gave it, and he gave it to us now. We should keep it just the way God said. And you know, the problem is that we, we don't do it. But anyway, I want you to see what the purpose of the law was. The purpose of the law was to condemn sin. Look back over in chapter 3, in verse number 19, when it says, this is Romans. It says, now we know that what so things... Uh, so whatever the law said, they said those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become uh, guilty before God because everyone has transgressed that law. But in verse number 20, then it tells us, so the law condemns sin. That's one purpose. But also notice at the end of verse number 20, it says, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Other words, that the, that the law identified or told us what sin is. Come back over to chapter 7, and you see in verse number 7, that's what Paul says. He says, nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. I didn't know what sin was until the law told me. He said, for I, he said, for I had not known lust except the law has said, thou should not covet. And let me throw something in right here that needs to be said. You know, Seventh-day Adventists, they say that the ceremonial law had been done away with, and yet the Ten Commandments are still binding. You know, I know they say that because another brother and myself, we had an informal debate with, with some Seventh-day Adventists in a house over in Fort Worth, and they said that. They said the ceremonial law had been done away with, but we're still under the Ten Commandments. But right here, Paul calls the Ten Commandments the law, too. And you remember Colossians 2, verse number 14, Ephesians 2, verse number 15, that the old law had been done away with in Christ. We're not under the Ten Commandments. And uh, uh, in the words of, J uh, of Johnny Ramsey, that'd be $2. Anyway, back to what he was saying. He said, I had not known sin. I didn't know sin. I didn't know what transgression, that's what sin is, transgression. I didn't know we were transgressing until the law. God gave us a law. And, 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 and that was the purpose of it. Back in chapter 4, verse number 15, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. But because God gave us a law, we know there is transgression. As a matter of fact, there was transgression before the law. Well, I'll take that back. I believe there, was, there wasn't transgression first because man have always been under the law. Let me say it this way. God gave us the law because he didn't want us to transgress. See, but he gave us a law because he knew ahead of time, not because, not because we had to, but because we would. And that's the reason why the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 9 that, that the law was not made for a righteous man. If everybody was righteous, there'd be no need for the law. But see, we have the law because everyone is not everyone transgressed. We had that tendency. We had that propensity to violate God's commands. So, Paul says, in verse number 10, because of that, because first, hey, we were transgress transgressing and we didn't know it, but now God gave us a law, and guess what? We're still transgressing. So, so he says in verse number 10, the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be under death. That commandment of God that I thought, hey, it's going to give us some life, guess what? It, it condemned us. It brought death in us. Why? Because we had violated, transgressed his word. And that's what Paul says, like in verse number 9, the commandment came, sin revived, I died. 
Verse number 10, here's the commandment. I thought it would be the life. Wait a minute. I found it to be unto death. And in the verse number 11, it slew me. Verse number 13, that which was good, that law, it brought death in me. And you know he's talking about spiritual death. It's already put on the man to physically die. Hebrews 9, and verse number 27. Ecclesiastes 3, verse number 2, a time to be born, a time to die. The living know that they will die, Ecclesiastes 9, and verse number 5. But he's talking about spiritual death. In Romans 6, and verse number 23, the wages of sin is death. Revelation 20, and verse number 14, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So Paul said, here is a predicament under the old law. Yeah, we were transgressing. God gave us a law. Guess what? It condemned us. It identified our sin and condemned us for sinning. So then Paul says, look, I'm going to tell you why. Let me tell you why we did that. Let me tell you why we were sinning. Why, why we struggled and failed. Look at verse number 8. He said, but sin taken occasion by the commandment. In other words, he's speaking of sin as though it's personified, as though it's alive, which is not sin, it's just transgression. But sin, here it is, that transgression was taken occasion or opportunity by the commandment or through the commandment because it caused us to do the opposite of the command. It caused us to transgress the command. Of course, that's what it has to do. Here is God's, here is God's command, but see, sin does what? It makes us transgress. And he says, why? See, he says, because uh, it worked wrought in us all matter of concupiscence, which is lust. That's the same word for lust that you see in verse number seven. So, yeah, yeah, we, we, we transgress God's command, and one reason is because of our lust. Now, you couple verse number eight with verse number 11, because he says, for here it, is, here it is again, sin, taking the occasion, opportunity by the command or through the command, caused us to do the opposite of the command. Guess what it says? And know why this time? Because of deception. It deceived me. And so you know what? You know who's behind that? That's the devil. My Bible says in Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 9 that the devil is the deceiver of the whole world. He's the one that calls us to transgress, and that's what's going on. The devil deceives people to transgress God's commands and he does it through our lust. Every time somebody uh, sins against God, you know what? The devil is treating us. Every time we sin, he treats us just like a donkey. He has a long pole with a carrot on it. And he's enticing us for that carrot through our lust. And God said, don't go this way, and don't you go that way. And that old devil is holding that pole, and he's swaying it in the way that God said not to go. And for we had that, that enticement, we want that, I desire for that carrot, so we go in the way that God said not to go. He sways back in the other way. God said, don't go that way, and we go that way too. And here's the deception. You're never going to get the carrot in a way. Amen. Just deceiving us. Let me show you the best illustration of this in the whole Bible is in Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3. Turn to Genesis chapter 2. <coughs> Genesis chapter 2, in verse number 16 and 17, God had made Adam, in verse number 7, and he gave him this command that you can eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree that's in the midst of the garden, don't eat of it. Because the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Toward the end of the chapter, he makes a woman from a river to man. And in chapter 3, she knew the command too. Don't eat of that tree. Well, in chapter 3, here is a serpent. And I know that's the devil working through the serpent because the devil is a deceiver. The devil is the one who tempts us to sin, even in Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus was led up of, of the Spirit into the wilderness, the wilderness to be tempted of who? The devil. So he's working through the serpent. And he said, has God said that you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said, yeah. He said, we can, eat, we can eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree that's in the midst of the garden, God said, of that fruit, don't you eat of it. And then she said, don't even touch it unless you die. And here's the deception. The deception is in verse number four. The serpent says, you shall not die. God said you will. Here's the, here's the devil deceiving. You won't die. 
Then he added some more deception in verse number five. He said, for God knows the day that you eat of it. In other words, God knows the day that you transgress, that your eyes will be open and you'll be as gods. Gods in that text is Elohim. It's talking about the Godhead. And then guess what? That's a deception. Now here it is through, through the lust. She says, in verse number six, it says, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, as the lust of the flesh, pleasant to the eyes, the lust of the eyes, and a tree desired to make one wise as the pride of life. Every human being is tempted, is, temp, is, is all tempted in the same way. In 1 Corinthians 10, in verse number 13, there is no temptation taking you, but such is common to man. And we're all tempted in the same three ways. 1 John 2, in verse number 16, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And as I said, hey, who's tempting us is not God, it's the devil. That's why the Bible says in James chapter 1, verse 13 to 15, let not a man say when he is tempted, that he is tempted, with, tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and neither tempted he any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away with his own lust and enticed, and when lust had conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and when sin is finished, it brings forth death. The devil doesn't make us do anything, but he entices us through our lust to transgress God's commands. So you know what the woman did? The woman ate of the tree. And you know, in verse number 13, God calls her up on the carpet. And this is what she says. God says, he said, what is this that thou hast done? And she says, the serpent beguiled me. He tricked me. He fooled me. He deceived me. Even in 1 Timothy 2, verse number 14, the Bible says the woman was deceived. Because you know why? Because she did not become like God, did she? They didn't become like God. And also, death did come that day. I know they subsequently died in, starting in chapter 5, but physical death began the day that they ate it. That's when death came. And also, spiritual death also came because the very last verse said God drove them out of the garden, so there's a separation between man and God. Now, I know what my subject was. You know, I was in with struggles. I'm trying to show you this is the struggle. The struggle is with the devil. This is when it began. It's been going on through the patriarchal dispensation, the mosaic dispensation, and the Christian dispensation. The devil has not retired. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 12 says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in our places against the devil. I know God said, God said, yes, you need to be with your own wife and you shouldn't fornicate, but y'all may have a desire, I want to fornicate. God said, don't lie, but I want to lie. God said, don't steal, but I want to steal. I know what it is, the devil enticing me to go against God's word. And guess what? And every human being goes with that. Even under the Mosaic Covenant, hey, in Christianity, it still goes on. So when you go back over to, to uh, Romans 7, In Romans 7, Paul says how this struggle is inside of me. See, God, God's word, which we have now, you know, we're supposed to have it inside of us now. Remember in, in uh, Jeremiah 31, verse 31 to 34, he could put his laws in our inward parts. In Psalm 119, verse, uh, verse 11, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. I know what God said. Like, Paul, I want to do what's right, don't you? And I don't know why I, I fail sometimes. I know I shouldn't say some things. I know I should be kind. I know I should repent. I know I shouldn't go there. I know I shouldn't do that. I know I shouldn't watch that. But see, there's a battle going on inside of us. And what's when he says in verse number 15? Let me deal with 14. Verse 14, he, said, he says, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Well, I know we weren't created carnal. Because when God made man and a woman in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, formed man from the dust of the ground, Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 7, at the end of Genesis chapter 1, when God had created everything, the very last verse says, verse 31, everything that God made was very good. And you know, I know we weren't born carnal because Jesus, as I said, he was born and he had no sin. 
I said 1 Peter 2, 21, 22. Hebrews 4, 15. Also 1 John 3, 5, who was manifest to take away our sin, and him was no sin. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. He made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. Wasn't born that way. I believe we become carnal when we give ourselves over to sin. That's when we become a slave of it because sin never serves us. We serve it. As I said, we, we have no excuse. Under any dispensation, no human being has an excuse to say they should have sinned against God. But as I said, we all do. We all have. So anyway, you see in verse number 15, here's that battle inside of us. He said, for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do not. What I hate, that do I. Verse number 19. He said, for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. I know I should do right, and I seem to always do wrong. And guess what? So, so he says in verse number 23, there's a war inside of me. I see another law warned in my members, warned against the law of my mind. Bring me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members because we're in this body and we're tempted of the devil in our flesh. So it says in verse number 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? In verse number 25, Paul knew, understood that this battle will continue. It will always be here because there's always a devil. The devil is our adversary. The devil is trying to destroy us. Read 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 8. And so he says, here's the remedy. The remedy, the solution, verse number 8, I mean chapter 8 and verse number 1, is Christ. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation if you're in Christ or you're a New Testament Christian. You know why? Because now we're under grace. In Romans chapter 5, verse number 21, it says, grace reigns through righteousness unto eternal life, which is according to God's word, because Psalm 119, verse 172, my tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. This, his word of the New Testament, this doctrine, this gospel, this good news. And, and guess what? Grace is not a license to sin, because in chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we which are dead to sin live any longer therein? But so, so we should do it according to God's word. That's what it says when it says, walk after the spirit by the word that the spirit gave. And uh, 2 Peter 1, 21, the prophecy of old time came not by the will of man, but holy men of God spake and they were moved by the Holy Spirit. He gave us the word to live by. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or the child of God may be perfect or complete, thoroughly and first in every good works. God's word, he gave it to live by now. Here's a solution for everybody. Here's how we can overcome the devil. That's why in verse number two, he says, the law of the spirit of life in Christ. There is life in Christ. There wasn't life under the Old Testament. It's condemnation of the Old Testament. There wasn't life apart from Christ. If you weren't a Christian, even in Ephesians 2 verse 12, Paul said we were in the world without God and without Christ. We were in the world without hope. There's no hope without Christ. It's in Christ. And guess what? We're free in Christ. We're free from the bondage of the old law, Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 1, and we're free from the law of sin and death. That's why in chapter 6 and verse 17 and 18, the brother Randall quoted, he said, but God be thanked that you were the servants, the doulos, the slaves of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form, that tupas, that mold, that pattern of doctrine, the daske, the daskaliah, teaching or instruction which was delivered you, being then made free from sin. When? When you obeyed it. You became what? The servants of righteousness. So you come in verse number three, that's what the law couldn't do. It could not free us from the law of sin and death. It could not free us from the bondage of the old law. But that's in Christ. 
You remember in Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 21 that the law, the, that the law could not give life? But what it could do in Galatians chapter 3 is purpose, another purpose, Galatians 3 verse 24, it was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we may be justified by faith. In other words, pardoned by faith. There's life in Christ through the gospel. That's the good news of the New Testament. In Romans chapter 1 and verse number 16, the gospel is God's power to save. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9 and 10, that God saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our own works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but now has been made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. That's why Jesus said in John 11 and verse 25 and 26, I am the resurrection and the life. And he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. There's life in Christ. There's a new life in Christ. Romans 6 verse 4. I'm born again, John 3, 5. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 17. And on and on, have a new way of worship with a new goal, heaven. All because of Jesus Christ. So when you look at it, it says in verse number three, God sent in his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, not that he had sin, but that he was made like us. And for sin, he was our sacrifice and condemned sin in the flesh because he overcame sin in the flesh. And you know what? So you have to become a New Testament Christian the way the Bible says. You have to get in Christ. That's what salvation is. 2 Timothy 2, verse number 10. Salvation is in Christ. There's no condemnation in Christ. If you don't walk according to the world, but you walk according to the Spirit, the word that the Spirit gave. But you got to be committed. And I believe that's what verse 5 and 6 is saying. I believe verse 6 is saying that you got to be committed. You got to be spiritually minded. In verse number five, you have to practice righteousness. You have to practice with Christianity. Make it your life. You have to mind the things of the Spirit. You have to do it. Like in Philippians chapter one, in verse number 27, when Paul says, he says, King James Version said, only let your life, only let your, it said, let your conversation, that's life, a matter of life, a way of life, a conduct, be as become the gospel of Christ. I know you obeyed the gospel to become a Christian, but now you got to put it into practice that your life is according to the gospel of the Lord. Philippians 2 and verse number 12, you got to continue to obey. And you have no excuse to say that you cannot do it. Yes, we can. Philippians 4 verse 13, we can do all the things that Christ would strengthen us, or we can do everything that God would have us to do. It's only in John 15, 5, without Christ, we can do nothing. But with Christ, we can do everything that he would have us to do. We can have life in Christ. Guess what? In Christ, it don't mean that, the, that we won't struggle with sin. Yes, we will struggle with sin. There's still a devil. We're still in these bodies. We're still in the flesh. But you know what? Even we might lose a battle or two, but we will win the war. We will win that war. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57, Christ gives us the victory. We can overcome our flesh. We can bring our flesh and our minds in a harmony of God's will. That's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, in verse number 27, I keep under my body and I bring it under subjection. Lest when I preach to others, I should be a castaway. And we got the struggle, but we can win this war against the devil. And we can do it with help from the Lord in Christ. God bless you. Oh, what marvelous mercy, what infinite love, what immeasurable grace I see. By his blood I am cleansed, I am happy and free. Through his suffering, God.